Hello, so let me introduce myself first and welcome to my lecture, which is going to be about Game Summer 3 by Amanita Design. My name is Tomáš Dvořák and I am audio or musical part of our team and I will be showing you for one hour like all interesting things which are behind this game, both image and audio. Uh, of course, image is not my total focus, but I got really nice pictures and all really interesting materials by my colleagues. And then the second half of the lecture will be about audio and music, and it's more like where I can say what. <laughs> so let me first shortly say something about our game. It's summer's free, and I think I can just say something about our company, which is Amanita Design. It's small, or we could say middle-sized indie studio based in Prague, Czech Republic. And we have currently around 20 people, and they work on four separated games or projects. But it all started with very small experimental projects which I will show later. And uh, we were slowly developing. There is a couple of our games, but I think the most famous, I could say, is Machinarium, which was released in 2009, and which really helped company to grow and develop more things, and develop also, in general, our universe, which we hope is unique. So let me just say something quickly about Samorost. Does anybody, did anybody play the game? Just, oh cool, <laughs> very nice. So uh, it's puzzle point and click adventure game and it's third, of course, video game title in the Samoros series and the sequel to Samoros 2. But it's the first full length and HD graphic game. The story takes place across five planets and four moons and Samoros 3 begins when little space gnome finds a strange magical flute that falls from the sky, and he uses the instrument's power to uncover hidden secrets of the world, travel to the cosmos in search of its origin, scoring the alien landscapes of five planets and four moons to solve clever mysteries along the way. Each of Samoros' three organically inspired biomes presents a uniquely colorful world full of hidden surprises and achievements for keen players to discover. It's probably important to say that, say that Samorost is kind of atmospheric game. It means that besides like playing and solving the puzzles, it's really important to just enjoy and be in the world of Samorost. So I will speak about this later more, but before, let me just show you the trailer.
So I would like to start first uh, saying some kind of background or story of our game, how it all started and how it developed. It's on the start, it's the story of our kind of leader, or I would maybe say boss, Jakub Dvorsky, who established the Amateur Design. It's him, very serious guy. But uh, he is, as me, uh, from Czech Republic, and he grew up in former Czechoslovakia in communistic times. And his both parents are visual artists. His father is scientific illustrator. Uh, if you go to library, you can see many of his like books. He painted, and his mother is artist. She works with um, metal objects, and she makes also paintings. So he is really coming from artistic background, but I think it's also important that we grew up in this environment of, for example, sto uh, children's stories like this. It's very famous Czech children's story, Maxi Pesvik from Jiří Šalamun. But also, for example, this is another important Czech artist, Karel Zeman, who in the 60s made incredible things uh, based on animation and combining them with the cinematic world. Also, he is a very big uh, fan of Russian animator Yuri Nurstein and Sifi, like Lem. Of course, we are a generation which started playing the games, very primitive games like this, Goblins. And Jakub says these games influenced his career. Or this one, Neverhood, which is often compared to our like games. Or, for example, this one, which is missed. But later, besides consuming stuff, uh, he started to explore the world around himself, and he started drawing and inventing fantasy worlds. And when he was 15, actually, really early, he started to make his own games. Later, he started to study School of Academy of Art and Architecture and Design, animation studio of Jiří Barta. And he had, as he said, lots of time to uh, you know, just go to pub because he was really bored in the school. <laughs> but also because it wasn't so fun, so he also went to nature. And he started to explore the world. And he got really attracted to diversity and beauty of nature. And he started to make photographies in nature. He even bought the camera for that. Also, he started to collect strange objects like this dried vegetable or visit strange places like this abandoned industrial buildings and so on. And all this came together in his first project, which was Samorost One. Uh, and he made this project still in the school as his final work in the school. He basically used pictures. He uh, photographed in nature and created colleges. And kind of creating his own world out of these images. And in contrast, he made animation in vector graphic for the figures. And he used some used music, so I haven't been included in the first game. He used music from DJ Crash and Bjork or some others. And he just put it on the internet because you have to imagine it was really a very long time ago because this project was in 2003. So there wasn't really like developed uh, possibilities for um, indie developers. So he basically put the uh, project on the internet and it became really popular. It was for free and uh, Samorost 1 was uh, played by millions of people. And it became really a viral hit. So it gave him some confidence to continue and he uh, started to work on the second project and he, and he invited me as musician and uh, animator friend and guy who made the sound. And we together created second Samros 2, which was more ambitious. It was our first commercial game, but it was still uh, for the internet, for the web. So first part, it was for free and then you could pay some very little money and uh, you could continue the game. So it was the time where there was not really like Steam, App Store, Google Play, so we had to really like found our, our experimental way how to make some small money on it. But it was enough money to 
continue the studio, and we started to work on a more ambitious project, which was Machinarium. And it was made and released in 2009, and it was, it was really our very successful game. Recently, it sold about four million copies. So I think this was really a break point, which helped us to continue and develop more projects. And also, Jakub started to help other developers, and he brought people into his company and developed more different things, like, for example, Botanicula, which you can also maybe know the game by Yara Plachy. So let's start to speak finally about Summer 3. This part will be about game design and uh, some things what Jakub considered when he, he was building the game. First of his goals was to create kind of living, believable micro world, which is simply joy to enter and just be there. So it's really like to, about the atmosphere, not really only about you know solving some puzzle and so on, and puzzles and so on. And then he also wanted to make some puzzles, which is like the core of adventure games, and he wanted to. Uh, combine these two aspects into one like simple uh, world. Here are some references what he considered. For example, this is Game Portos, which is typical walking simulator, and there is not any challenge at all. You can just be there and you know enjoy the environment. Another uh, type of games which Jakub references our game is games like Windows or Meta. Uh, Metamorphabet by Vector Park, which is not really difficult to play. There is no, nothing hard to solve, but it's fun to play. You know, it's it's really like fun to play with the objects, with the physics, and so on. Another of the example are the games like Monument Volley or The Room, which are uh, looking very sophisticated and hard, but they are actually easy. So. It's kind of trick that people have feeling that they are solving something very like special, but it's actually not so hard to play these games. And finally, this type of game, it, it teaches you. So you start with very simple task, and then you develop, develop, and in the end, you make really sophisticated intellectual puzzles. So let's jump to our game. and. In comparison to these all references, let's show you what we have created. This is part of our game. Which is a puzzle, some kind of mini puzzle of three uh, small creatures, salamanders. And it's both puzzle, but also toy. You can basically operate them by these uh, straws, and they can sing different loops. So you can choose what loop you like, and you can combine it with the other, and you can create your own unique music. You can play with it as long as you want. And beside that, you have to find the right combination to continue the game. This is another example. It's my very favorite part or maybe my most favorite puzzle from the game, which is based on cards, but they are very magical. Basically, you have to find the right sequence of cards to make the hunters hunt the animal and kill it and put it on the fire. So you are putting the uh, cards into the sequence, and you are trying to find the right order, and then when you find the right order, you get the animal, and you can, you have to collect four animals like this, and then you are finished. I think it's really tricky because it's very playful, and kind of very unique for me, this puzzle. I have never seen something like that. Finally, this example, it's showing our achievements, which are things which you can really do, and but you don't need to. They are just there, and if you want, you can play with them, and for example, solve this achievement, but you don't need to do it. So it's a, again about the joy of being in our world. This is 
uh, page of our achievements, but it's at the same time also another toy because each of the achievements it has its own music, which comes from the achievement you solve. So, uh, more you collect, you have more musical loops, and then you can make your own song again, like in this example, just to show you a few. This, yeah. They, they, they have all their sounds and they reference to all the mm. puzzles you solved. Okay. Now I would like to show you uh, quickly some of the designing process behind the puzzles and location and characters. These are sketches from Jakub notebooks which are pretty wild, as you see. Uh, in the start, he just goes somewhere to the nature or some quiet place, and he just, you know, for maybe a year or some time, he's just writing down the idea for the game. There, are, there is everything. There are ideas for the characters, for the puzzles, for the world where the game should be in, and so on. He uses very small notebooks, and then, you know, writes down the ideas. So these are some of the pages from the notebooks. Old school way, as you see. <laughs> and Jakub says it's his most favorite part of the development, which I understand because there is not any struggle. You can just imagine how the things will be like beautiful before you really start to <laughs> fight with all the technology and so on. This is page of characters what Jakub uh, have drawn for the game. And then he has to go to the computer and he starts to draw uh, some basic uh, sketches or drafts of, of, uh, of the scenes in the game and with, where are included all the like visuals and of course concept, conceptual visuals and also the, uh, the puzzles ideas. So here are a few, few uh, of his sketches from computer, which you may maybe can recognize or find reference to places in the game, if you play the game. Then another part is that he writes this document, uh, which is our kind of Bible. Everybody uses this document and there is like description of all the locations and all the puzzles and all the things that are in the games, and we all use it, or, 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 or people from our team, to work on the game more. Then comes art, which is visual side of our game. The main guy behind the art is Adolf Flachmann. He is originally a painter. He is my former, uh, like he was my colleague from the school. I studied uh, Academy of Visual Arts, and he did also, but he was in painting the apartment and I was studying new media. But anyway, he's really a very uh, big professional. He has a really great eye for all the visuals and he creates wonderful things in his <laughs> crazy <laughs> studio. <laughs> you know. So it starts in the beginning uh, with discussion between Jakub and Adolf how the game should look like. So. Again, there is kind of conceptual sketch from Jakub notebooks, and the, then you can see the final final result. As you see, it's kind of long way <laughs> to go. Maybe sometimes not. For example, this is the sketch what Jakub gave to Adolf for our main uh, cover art, and this is the result. <laughs> so. Some, more, some less important details were added, as you could see. Then uh, we have to find the right art style for the game. For example, in the case of Machinaru, we made this game uh, based on drawing, handmade drawing. And uh, you see that Adolf, he is using left hand, but is actually right handed. And it's because uh, he draw, he has been drawing so perfectly that Jakub didn't like his drawing. So he, he gave him quite hard task that he has to make all the game with the left, left hand. And it, and it was kind of okay. 
So he kind of learned how to draw with the other hand also. This is the screenshot from Machinarium. But in case of uh, Samoros 3, we were looking for some different. Uh, this is original uh, drawing by Jakub of the location. And they started to think about the visual style of the game. So Adolf started to make some first basic idea how it should look like. And he started to put some pictures in the style of previous Samorosts into the location. But they didn't really like it because it was kind of chemical, maybe slimy, unpleasant. So they started to think about other way, which is kind of similar to machinarium, basically drawing everything with the handmade drawing, pencil drawing on paper, and then shading it in computer. But it wasn't good either. It was kind of, you know, uh, too obvious, maybe not too magical, or how you could say. So they choose, in the end, the hardest part. Uh, and it is that it's a combination of both picture and digital. Uh, the things are drawn in tablet, on tablet, and then they are combined with the real textures from nature, which means using enormous amount of flyers, which are kind of creating the environment. Here you can see some of the examples how, beside drawing, what is like the basic thing of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the screen, how uh, different pictures were used. And this is the final picture. It takes really enormous time to create each location, lots of work. There is one example. This is a location from the home planet. And for this, uh, Adolf decided he will build on his own rock, so he made a small uh, model of the rock. He made a photo of it, and he used it for the location. And he started to perfect it with different layers. As you can see, lots of, lots of small layers. Then he started to add the objects, like our little mushroom, which is actually the rocket, which Gnome uses to fly. Then he started to create the different uh, layers for parallax scrolling. There were later up to 10 layers of this. And again, adding more details until it was perfect. So, another part of his work was working on the characters. Originally, they started to do some very complex characters, you know, and then deciding which version to go. But as you see, it's again a long process, and it took lots of time to draw each character and to decide about it. So, in the end, they choose a different way. They usually just have drawn some ideas in the location, very in a very easy and fast way. And then they decided what to, what to choose, and this then was like perfected, like in the case of this guy who makes tea on our wooden planet. These are some uh, drawings from different parts of the games, of the game, sorry, uh, which are, for example, these help pages which were made originally by Jakub, so it was not made by Adolf. Also, Jakub made these books, which uh, describe the story, which is behind the story of Samorost 3. And finally, he made these location pictures. So, now I would like to show you something from animation. This is our animator, uh, hard worker, Václav Blín. He had to, again, create enormous amount of animations. Uh, for this, I need to go into different part. So, let me show you some examples of animation from the game. Usually, we used 
two different sorts. Either uh, Václav created parts of body, and then they then he started to animate these parts separately, like in the case of this monk. The good thing about it is that he could create then when he has the parts, lots of different variation of the motion. Or this is the animation of our evil monk. Again, he created parts of body and then he started to animate them separately into one uh, united motion. This is our part. And this is our dragon. <laughs> So sometimes it's really hard, and the hardest was, of course, our little gnome because he has enormous amount of animations and also sounds, by the way. So these are all different sequences that we used in the game, and everything is made again in hand to way. No kind of you know computer algorithmic stuff. Everything is like old good animation. We also used different sorts of animations like this vector graphic base, which is frame by frame, and you need to be really good animator to make this so fluent and well looking, I would say. Sorry. We use this for the ghosts because there is lots of spirits and ghosts in the game and uh, they say different stories. So we use this for the stories of spirits. There is spirit of uh, tar tortoise, for example. <laughs> so this is about animation. And I am getting back to my main presentation. Yes. So there are three stats, as I have already said, uh, of animation. And it's very important that actually they were made by three different people and they all have to come together in very, into one coherent style. Uh, let me speak very quickly about technology. This is our programmer and his name is David Oliva, and he made and programmed the game just on his own, which was really crazy thing to do. Uh, we, we, we created 50k bitmaps, 20k vector shapes, 4,000 sounds, and it's quite crazy, you know, as you see. Uh, we used very basic technology, uh, which is Flash, because it is really good uh, technology for animation. But there are some external and frameworks with what we used. We used Starlink framework and uh, of course, JavaScript, Flash scripting, and lots of tools which are external. So it's kind of more sophisticated Flash development-based game. So finally, music and sound, which is my <laughs> area. We made the game uh, in three people. Uh, beside me, I was working on music, but also I did lots of sound design and atmospheric sounds for the game and voice recordings. But we had also another guy, Tomáš Dvořák, He's the, he has the same name as me. It's a total coincidence, but it's quite a usual name in Czech Republic. So, so another Tomáš Dvořák, he uh, worked on the fully recordings and on sound integration. And then we had a special guy who, who just worked on the post-production, meaning he was trying to perfect the sound in a way like to, that it sounds really good. So we, we put really extra attention to sound of the game, and I think it's possible to hear, hopefully. Uh, my first game I did with Amanita was Samaros 2, and uh, it's different than Machinarium. This one example of the music. I think the main difference is that uh, Samaros 2 was very nat natural based, I was trying to 
combine uh, sounds, acoustical sounds, like, you know, clarinet, strings, whatever I found, and then try to process it in computer and create something unique. And it was made in 2005, six, and it was quite still one of the first, I would say, game which has a bit different sound because we were in the time mostly fighting with the majors and they had their own kind of uh, cliches, like, you know, big sounding orchestra, like symphonic orchestra made in samples and then 8-bit music, but there were not so much music uh, which would uh, try to create something like maybe more unique. So it was my kind of task in this game. Another game I made is Machinarium, which was more based on the electronic sounds, but it was kind of old sounds, old vintage sounds, lots of noises, old equipment, or they, it, it was trying to pretend that it's old equipment, sometimes it was not, but all this kind of rustiness of sound and dirtiness, but it was electronic world. So it was different concept a bit. Finally, uh, for summer roast music, it was I, I wanted to make something different. Uh, sorry, originally I wanted to make just uh, you know some recording with small orchestra. So I wanted to make it really like kind of pure, just writing maybe scores and. Uh, recording it with musicians, but then I found it, it's kind of boring for me, kind of, maybe I couldn't write something that would be too uh, surprising. So I started to again experiment, and I think the main difference in comparison to previous Summerost is that I started to experiment more in the real world. So I started to look for sounds which are in the real world and they are interesting, and they could sound funny or inspiring and less caring about the uh, you know stuff in computer I would say and also I try to simplify the music quite a lot so for example the music what I will play now it's made of lots of organic stuff basically all the vegetables so I used cauliflower or eggplant carrots stuff like that to create this music Even the bass is made from eggplant, actually. This is another example. The good thing about Samoros 3 was that there are different planets. So I tried to choose different kind of concept for each uh, planet. So for example, for this, I tried to make some kind of because this planet, it's very dry and deserty, very wooden. So I invited uh, my friend, he's cellist, Tomáš Jamník, and we recorded uh, lots of sounds uh, for this environment, especially his viola da gamba, which is old version of cello, and also Chinese instrument erhu, and classical cello too. And I also try to make mix of the music very kind of airy. This is the result, one example. This is the next planet and it's the total opposite. It's very heavy, dense sound. So I used uh, lots of old analog stuff, old analog equipment, and I tried to make the mus music sound really like kind of, again, heavy, not airy. Also funny, in a way. Because it's uh, made of rock and it's very volcanic, so again, I try to reflect this in my sound universe. Well, actually, every song has its kind of sound universe. For example, this is music from Cards. Which this song is called Prenatal Hunters because I try to make some kind of combination of electronic music and kind of very 
ancient, you know, uh, tribal music. And I tried to make this music also very simple, like that you could enjoy each sound separately. So, for example, it starts just with one simple sound, which discreetly goes. This is music from the final part of the game, which is very different. And kind of dance and nasty and lots of distortion. So again, different sound universe I try to create around it. Also, I try to work with the teams in the game, which was very helpful for me because I usually try to find one team for one part of the game or for some character and try to play it in different versions through the, through the game. So, for example, in the case of main team, this one example, this is the team which I used, like, repeating Ida during the song, so you could hear that this team is performed in different ways during all the song, which is around nine minutes, and it shows like the adventure of the gnome, he goes through different parts of the game. And then I used it in the end, this is the final part of the game, when the monks are playing it. So, so let me just show you how we did some things here. I will first play some funny video. <laughs> so uh, this is part from Salamanders you have already seen and it was really funny because I was trying to find some person for these creatures for a long time and I was thinking that I will probably have to find for each Salamander some person but in the end, this guy made all three because he was so. He gave it such a unique voice and he could make very different sorts of voices, you know, so he was absolutely perfect. It's Miloš Vořáček. And his occupation is actually his drummer. He's, he has nothing to do with, you know, <laughs> acting, work. So this is example of some ideas, as I told you, like I try to often make sounds out of computer, just trying to find some interesting sounds. So, for example, this song, it is for First Planet. It's a song of mushrooms. I tried to make some song of some spirits of mushrooms, and it was, all the song was just made from this pure sound. So everything you can hear there, it's just out of this drum, which is touched by the gummy stick. This is the result. Hey! 
So this is Chinese erhu, traditional er er instrument. But my friend, he really can't play it very well. So I think he played it almost like cello. So I think it's not typical kind of sound of it. This is the old baroque cello, very old instrument we used for this part. Sometimes we try to hack the instrument in some way, like in this part, to make it more kind of, to basically imitate the sound of crickets. We had to put some metallic objects into strings to make them more like shaking. It's, of course, my basic instrument. I played from six years, so I think it's the reason why actually Jakub wanted to include it into the game, because he knows that I play it and there is the story of magical flute in the game. This is the way how our sound effect guy works. <laughs> <laughs> this is another friend of mine. He did Evil Monk. Funny thing about this uh, recording was that he came just for 15 minutes and he did this totally ex exaggerated job and then he left. So it was like 15, 15 minutes work, you know, ah, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> so, yeah, so as you see, we had sometimes fun working on this game, but sometimes it was struggle to find out the right person or right sound for the game, of course. So I will just show quickly some instruments I used, some more instruments I used. Uh, this is my studio where I work. And there is lots of like things inside of the computer, lots of samples. I record regularly in my own sample banks and then I use them for my songs and lots of outboard equipment, but also lots of things like inside of the computer. And very important instrument is piano. And there are more like instruments that I uh, frequently used in this soundtrack, but I think the most important is the clarinet, which is on the left. That one, yes. Again, there is one more example. As was already mentioned, we used, we used the sound of the clarinet for the magical flute. <laughs> also, I used uh, more flutes. I think the sound of flute is really unique because it uh, reminds me the sound of human voice. And 
so there is lots of creature and it sounds to me like they would kind of sing. And if I can transfer this into music, I found it quite interesting. So I used lots of different flutes, but not in a very typical way. For example, I often used just the upper part of the tenor flute or you know very strange flutes like this party flutes that <laughs> you see there. This was recorded on the big tenor flute. Or there is a picture of one of the roots I was recording. I was just drumming on it and then I used it in the, in the song. Also, I had to uh, collect lots of cho harp, which is the instrument on the right. And it's because uh, we had special task in the game. There is lots of these tentacles of beetles. And I had to find, basically, for every tentacle, I had to find new sounds. So I, I had to really collect lots of instruments of this sort. So, but you could see on this picture, on the right side, that right uh, jaw harp, which looks like palette, it's quite unique because it's from China. You can't really get it anywhere else. And it's very unique because normally jaw harp is played like through the mouth and you can just make one tone with it, but this one, it's polyphonic. But it's very dangerous because you can often hurt yourself. There are some needles in it and it's quite dangerous. So I, for example, use this Chinese jaw harp in this. But I also, for example, used bicycle. It's a very inspiring instrument for this music. I played the wires in the wheels. They, every wire has its own sound, every, it's its own pitch. And it's perfect for creating chamber music, or music from kind of chamber. Yeah, I used lots of uh, old equipment like these space echoes and spring reverbs, old synths, but also new synths. <laughs> I just would like to say uh, one simple thought. I used a lot this in, uh, or I use it generally in my music. Uh, I'm trying to not always work on the music directly, but I'm just trying to create an environment for the music, meaning that I don't really compose, but I create things which I will later use, like my longer hand, you know, like trying to find interesting uh, configuration of equipment which work nicely together. So then I don't need to find for the sound, but I can just quickly go and use it. So these are kind of examples of the equipments I used. But I think it's interesting to think about the creative process in this way, in general. It doesn't need to be about music only. So finally, let me show you a few examples, again, like how I did some sounds, like this, this one. This is puzzle. And I basically used for all the sounds just one instrument again. And it's uh, the tenor flute, what you have seen previously on the picture. This is a kind of a screenshot, you could say, of my session. First, I recorded very detuned voices of the flute. It was on purpose that tune because they created more this voicey feeling. And then I added some more sounds, like by mouth, made by mouth. Then I put it into keyboard so I could play different uh, pitches. And I could play more of them together. So it starts to already sound familiar. 
but it still was kind of static. So I added some modulation so that the sound goes up and down. And it kind of reflects this motion when you start to move the puzzle or the spirit. And then I again added more layers, so it's more kind of, there's more detail and it's kind of more deep. And for this sounds, I just again recorded with the flute some short percussive sounds. And then created different variations. So this is example how one of the sounds were, was made. And actually I made it more complex, but guys from Amarita didn't like it, so I was simplifying, simplifying until really using just the flute for the sound of these spirits. And this is salamanders you have seen already, but let me just show you quickly some tricks behind them behind the sound of them. So these are the different voices and they were made all by one guy, but to make them sound different, I had to use some tricks for that. But first I had to create some ideas, so I just recorded my own ideas. I tried to be like... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and then I invited a friend of mine, you have seen him in the document, and he replayed or asynced the ideas. This is for the bus salamander. And we used some tricks, like, for example, we recorded the salamander uh, in higher pitch, so we could then slow it down, and he sounds more deep. And we used some effects, so every every salamander sounds a bit different, but as I said, it was made by just one guy. Another trick was that all the loops had to work together, so we had to create something really simple, so that every loop is possible to combine with other loop. And this was kind of project where we could try, like, if it works together or not. And then it was of course exported and used in the game. Okay. So this is my last uh, topic and it's example of dramaturgy in the game and it's quite tricky because in previous games we used very simple concepts like, for example, one music for one image. But here music always changes and develops and the, our little hero gnome can go wherever he wants. So we had to find some tricky ways how to make it. This is one example. It's from the planet of monks. The first problem was that there is instrument which you can see on the right side and this instrument is musical instrument which is nice but then I had to somehow make music which would work together with the instrument so whenever the user wants to play it, it works. So this is the example. He can randomly choose some tones and they will always like somehow work with the music. Even this singing of <gasps> small mouse must work. You 
I was uh, uh, often solving the way how to trigger new music and uh, in the beginning I thought it will be probably based on locations like when the little gnome uh, comes into some location he will probably trigger some musical part but it didn't work very well because you don't really know where he is coming and so he has lots of options where he can go so in the end it was more based on the action like in this example like Music starts to play when he goes into the boat, and there is still music in the background from the other location playing, but over that, there is another music which works together with the background music, and it's triggered by the coming into the boat. And another example of this principle is this action. Yo, yo, yo. Oh. <gasps> When Gnome talks to our big hero, <laughs> he triggers another more action-based music. Which is this music. And it's suddenly all the parts mm -hmm. of the of the game, they work differently. So the previous music is not in the locations, but now there is this one. And the task was that this instrument then had to work in the music, even rhythmically, so... Here you can see example that the music plays on time and it's synchronized, so whatever you can, we want to play, it will be synchronized with the music that plays in the background. It's even more tricky because there is one cue point, which is when the gnome takes this pumpkin, and the music goes in loop, but when he takes it, takes it, it, music changes. So it's another cue. Music goes in loop, but when he takes the pumpkin, it continues. And, and it's the final part of the music, actually. This was just one example. As you see, it looks maybe simple, but sometimes it's not so simple. And this is the full diagram of all the interaction of different layers of the music and cues which triggers another part of music. Sometimes it's loop, sometimes it's layered with different music and so on. And that's everything I have. So thank you for your attention.